Hi everyone, I'm Benjamin Yang. If you're new to this channel, welcome. If you're not, welcome back. For those of you who are new to this channel, I make videos based on my experience as a biology tutor. And I hope that my videos will help you whether you're a current student, soon to be, or if you're here just for the fun of it. Without further delay, let's get on with today's video. This is the second part of the Beam Therapeutics series where I talk about the NASDAQ listed stock. If you'd like to know more about the scientific basis behind its products, an i button will appear right now above me that you can click and refer back to it. In this video, I'm going to talk about how Beam products can potentially be used in the treatment of human disease. And after that, I'm going to talk about how Beam products stack up against their competitors. And if you stay to the end of this video, I'm going to make a big announcement and I promise it'll be something good. Let me be upfront. I actually own two small positions in this company. First position at $25 and second position at $23. Let me make this clear. In no way am I a financial advisor or am I advising you to invest in this company. In fact, I'm only presenting the science behind the products. I'm not going to talk about the business, neither am I going to talk about how the business is run. There are many products that Beam Therapeutics is developing right now. The science of what I will discuss will focus on Beam 101 and 102. Let me know in the comments section below if you want me to cover the rest shown in the table except for the undisclosed options lab. Alright, the first target that Beam Therapeutics want to tackle is sickle cell disease. So, let me run through some numbers for you as to why this is an important one to tackle. There are 4.4 million people in 2015 with this disease with an additional 43 million people having a less severe form known as sickle cell trait. Let me talk about the difference between them before I return to the numbers. What is the difference between sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait? In a previous video, I mentioned that sickle cell disease is due to a mutation in beta globin gene that produces a subunit of hemoglobin which carries blood gases. Because we are diploid organisms, meaning we've got two copies of beta globin gene. One coming from mum through DNA in her ovum, and the other copy from dad through DNA in his sperm. If one out of two copies are mutated, then it is a sickle cell trait since there is a normal copy left. And if you were to take some blood from this person, you will observe some sickled red blood cells amongst other normal ones. This explains why this disease is less severe. If both copies are mutated, then all the red blood cells are sickled and this represents the biggest decline in biological function and therefore is associated with the severest form, therefore called sickle cell disease. Now, let's get back to the numbers. Four things I want to talk about. First, 4.4 million people represents a business opportunity for biotech companies because it is common enough that targeting it will produce a viable revenue. Some genetic diseases are so rare that it cannot generate enough returns. Second, sickle cell disease is associated with lifelong treatment including blood transfusions, Drugs used to prevent or eliminate a higher chance of multiple infections. Drugs such as hydroxyurea that improves the quality of life as well as hospitalization costs beyond all these treatments. From the patient's perspective, they suffer from chronic pain as well as potential organ failures involving the eye, spleen and kidneys. Correction at the genetic level is potentially curative and completely eliminates further treatment and all the clinical effects of this disease. This is a need problem and not a want. So market demand is guaranteed. Third, sickle cell trait patients are unlikely to seek treatment since their condition is less severe and they can live life almost normally. In fact, in places where a type of microorganism called malaria parasite is prevalent, those with sickle cell trait are actually more resistant to the life-threatening effects of this infection. This guarantees that there will be new sickle cell disease patients in the future as long as this parasite persists. And let me explain this. A sickle cell trait person has one normal copy and one mutated copy of beta globin gene and we call them carriers. 
when a carrier marries another carrier, there is a one quarter chance the offspring will have sickle cell disease in need of the genetic correction. Half a chance of producing new carriers and another one quarter chance of producing normal individuals. And let me emphasize this again. There are 43 million carriers in 2015. Odds are these marriages will continue to produce new individuals in future with sickle cell disease. So the market demand will continue well into the future. Fourth, whilst Africa seems to be the epicenter of the mutations because of the migrations of individuals either because of politics or economic reasons, this has allowed the gene to flow into developed countries such as the US, France, UK, even the Middle East gradually, causing the incidence to rise in these nations. Interestingly, in some European countries, the incidences have even overtaken previously more familiar genetic conditions like haemophilia and cystic fibrosis. Looking at the bean products slate, I'm going to focus on 101 and 102 since they are closer to clinical trials. Beam Therapeutics chose two ways to target sickle cell disease and named them 101 and 102. Even though they are targeting the same disease, they do so in two different ways. Let me explain how each of them will solve the problem. The first way is to activate fetal hemoglobin. This hemoglobin is of course different from adult hemoglobin, which is made up of two alpha and two beta globin subunits. Whereas the fetal hemoglobin is made up of two alpha and two gamma globin subunits instead. Gamma globin subunits are coded for by gamma genes and these are only expressed in the fetal stages of development. So some of you may be wondering, why? The reason is because fetuses are in the mother's womb and do not have direct access to air. Instead, they have to pull oxygen from their mother's hemoglobin. And to do that, their hemoglobin have to have higher oxygen affinity. But why then does the gamma globin gene switch off afterwards? Well, this oxygen affinity is a double-edged sword. It pulls oxygen much more readily, but it is not going to give it up easily either. This is not a problem when the fetus have relatively lesser mass of cells that require oxygen. But the adult, on the other hand, will require far more oxygen, so the hemoglobin has to switch back to the adult version. Then, why switch it back on for sickle cell disease. This is because, as we have learned earlier, that beta globin is affected in forming hemoglobin, which in turn severely affects the health of a patient. Even though fetal hemoglobin is not ideal, at least it is better than nothing. In fact, current drug treatment involves the use of hydroxyurea for sickle cell disease patients. This has been found to induce the very expression of the gamma globin gene. Of course, the question next is why use base editing to switch on gamma globin gene since hydroxyurea, as mentioned earlier, is doing that. The reason is because hydroxyurea is a chemical which means eventually it will be degraded and removed from the system. So the patient have to take this drug for the lifetime. Not only that, they are known to cause cancer mutations as well as suppress the synthesis of other blood cells. Base editing to induce gamma globin gene expression can potentially be a one-time, no side effects solution. Imagine the patient's lives that can be improved with this option. However, this option, as sexy as it sounds, is not perfect because the sickle cell mutation is still present, which is where 102 comes in. As mentioned in my part one video, it corrects the sickle cell mutation back to the normal variant of it. Now, let me provide the latest updates with regards to these two products. In December of 2020, Beam Therapeutics just released more data showing that 101 have not caused other non-targeted, unintended mutations, 
even at extremely high concentrations. This is important as that is the first worry when using these interventions for sickle cell disease. Second, and the base editing persists after application. This is also important as we do not want the cell to revert back to the original mutation, do we? Third, one or two have been shown to completely eliminate the presence of sickle red blood cells. All this exciting data will further support the success of receiving the IND by the US FDA, which will allow them to start clinical trials proper. So, why two different products targeting the same disease? Well, drug trials are like Russian roulette. Even though the signs may check out, we need to be absolutely sure that they are safe and they do what they are meant to do. This is no easy task and by increasing the options, whichever can successfully pass clinical trials can immediately be implemented with another in the pipeline. This is likened to Tesla where they first started with a roadster which then allowed them to continue the development to build and release Model S and then after that Model X followed by Model 3 and now Model Y and so on. Look at where they are today. In addition, if you see the table again, you will notice that 101 at the same time can be used to target another disease even though in theory, 101 is not as good as 102 when it comes to treating sickle cell disease. This disease is called beta thalassemia. This involves another mutation in the beta globin gene which do not produce sickle red blood cells but instead reduces the amount of beta globin produced. This results in smaller red blood cells and since fetal hemoglobin can be induced by BIM101, this also solves another but related red blood cell disease. How convenient! Not only that, and also further increases the clinical utility of this potential treatment. Unfortunately, I do not have time to dwell on it and we must move on. Right now, there are three other biotech companies that's competing in this space. CRISPR Therapeutics, Intellia Therapeutics, and Editas Medicine. Interestingly, Editas is also founded by Professor David Liu, who has founded Beam Therapeutics. CRISPR Therapeutics is well known because ARK Invest, a famous fund house with an exchange-traded fund specifically focused on genomic revolutions holds stock positions in this company. They also mentioned that they are the closest to the market. However, even though they are scientifically sound, I'm going to make a bold statement here and say that they are using old technology. To explain this, let me talk about computer chip development. We all know Intel have been developing computer chips with which our computers have been running on and they get the job done. However, Apple recently came out with the M1 chip that has been shown to be far superior. Apple software runs buttery smooth and fast and the battery life per unit mass of the battery exceeds the competitors. I see beam therapeutics technology in this manner as well. This is because none of the rivals are able to do base corrections at the level of precision and elegance this company offers. So whilst the other companies are making the headlines, this company is quietly making strides. And with that, we've come to the end of this video. Now, it's announcement time! So, I've decided to create even more videos of Beam Therapeutics. This is because I found very few videos on YouTube even talking about the company. Please stay tuned. And with that, you've been awesome and I'm Benjamin Young. See you in the next video.